this week is probably one of my favorite weeks scripturally because I love, love, love Stephen's sermon. It is the longest sermon recorded on the pages of history. Uh, when we think about the fact that uh, when the Word of God was originally written, it was written on these long, very expensive pieces of papyrus, the fact that every detailed word of this sermon has been recorded and kept for us over time, I believe is highly, highly significant. And as I was pouring through this portion of scripture, um, I, I really just began to search and ask the Lord, why is, why is this portion so detailed for us and what is it that we are supposed to really be taking from it and learning from it and understanding from it. And last spring when I was able to go to Israel and spend quite a bit of time um, talking with our tour guide who was an Orthodox Jew, one of the things that really strikes me about Stephen's sermon is there is probably um, no other portion on the pages of scripture that really provide a solid explanation for an Orthodox Jew as to why Jesus can actually be the Messiah. It explains the obstacles that they face in understanding and accepting that probably more clearly than any other portion of Scripture. And so I, I believe that God is really going to use that portion of Scripture um, to influence his people at some point, at some point. Um, but of course, the other thing about this portion of scripture that I can't stand is, is what happens to Stephen at the end. And I really scratched my head with it because I thought, Lord, why is it that you would take such an incredibly godly man with so much giftedness and so much understanding of your will and your ways and just kind of snatch him up? to heaven as quickly as he enters the pages of scripture. And it, it's just one of those things that we just can't understand, we can't wrap our mind around, we can't figure out why the Lord in his timing and in his will would do that. Um, but what I want to go from that today is to talk about what is God's timing and will for us. Because we are here. We have not been snatched up into the clouds of heaven. Uh, the Lord has chosen to uh, keep us here. And so what is it that the Lord has for you and I? And so the lesson today is, is called anointed and appointed. Anointed and appointed. And it comes from 1 John 2. 20 through 29, and I'm not going to read this entire uh, passage, but I am going to read portions of it, and I'm going to read it in the Amplified Classic version, because I love the way it is worded in this section. But this is what John says, and again, we are looking at the Apostle John at the end of his life, and this is what he says, but you have been anointed by... You hold a sacred appointment from, you have been given an unction from the Holy One, and you all know the truth. Who is the truth? Christ. Jesus is the truth. You all know the truth, or you know all things. Now I'm going to skip down to 24. As for you, keep in your hearts what you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the first dwells and remains in you, then you will dwell in the Son and in the Father always. Now, this is the part about this translation I don't like because that if makes it sound conditional. A better way to translate it would be since. Since what you heard from the first dwells and remains in you. Or because, because what you heard from the first dwells and remains in you, then you will dwell in the Son and in the Father always. And this is what he himself has promised us, the life, the eternal life. But as for you, the anointing, the sacred appointment, the unction, which you received from him abides permanently in you, so then 
you have no need that anyone should instruct you. But just as his anointing teaches you concerning everything and is true and is no falsehood, so you must abide in or live in, never depart from him, being rooted in him, knit to him, just as his anointing has taught you to do. And now, little children, abide, live, remain permanently in him, so that when he is made visible, we may have and enjoy perfect confidence, boldness, assurance, and not be ashamed and shrink from him at his coming. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. When we look at this word in Greek, the word is chrisma or kriomai. And what it means is an endowment, an anointing to consecrate to an office or religious service or to furnish what is needed. To furnish what is needed. The word picture that it gives is this idea of like when they anointed the Old Testament priests under Aaron and the priesthood and they would smear oil over them or when the prophets would put oil over the kings. It's a consecration. It's being set apart for a specific purpose, okay? The, the priest was being set apart for a specific purpose. The king was being set apart for a specific purpose. What John is telling us here is that you and I have been anointed by the Holy Spirit and we have been appointed, we have been given an unction or a, a, a passion or a desire or some sort of calling for a specific purpose as followers of Christ. I want that just to rest on you for a minute. You have been anointed and you have been appointed you have, been given, you have been given the Spirit. You have been endowed with the Spirit. You have been furnished with everything that is needed for a specific purpose within the kingdom of God. Now John goes on to explain that and he says, you know all things because you know the truth. Because I can already, you don't even have to say anything. I can already hear you and say, well, I don't know what it is, and I don't have the skill set, and I'm shy, and I haven't been a Christian that long, and I don't really know my Bible, and I'm not very eloquent, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And John says, no, you have been given all things because you know the truth. If you know Jesus, you have been given, you have been endowed with what you need to fulfill this appointment and, and you have been given the anointing. It's not based on you. It's not based on me. It's not based on uh, whatever skill set or natural ability we have. It's based on God's supernatural anointing and appointing. Now we see this in the lives of the apostles. Peter had an, an anointing and an appointing to go and heal. And he had that unction to go and, and heal that specific lame man. And Barnabas had an anointing and an appointing to give. And he went and he sold a piece of property and he laid it at, the, at Peter's feet and the rest of the disciples. And we see Stephen had an anointing and appointing to go and preach to the Sanhedrin and, and preach the most eloquent sermon on the pages of Scripture. He had an anointing and an appointing for that moment in time, for that specific purpose. So what is your anointing and appointing? Do we know what it is? Have we Ask the Lord what it is. 
I find it so interesting when we look at this concept of being anointed and appointed, there's two elements to it. There's this element to it of everything that God does and God gives and God provides. And then it is coupled with this act of obedience, this exercise of faith on the part of the one who received it. Do you notice that? I mean, think about Peter walking up to the temple, and there are beggars and lame men everywhere. And somewhere, at some point, he has got to listen to the Spirit of God tell him to go to that particular man, and he has got to exercise enough faith that he is going to be able to heal that man on his own. Because this is the first time Peter has done a physical miracle like that since Jesus has left. There's an element, there's an exercise of faith that Peter has to step out on. Think about Barnabas selling his piece of property. There's an exercise of faith, isn't there? What if I, what if I need that money someday? What, what, if I, what if I don't have enough later if I sell it now? There's an exercise of faith and an act of obedience coupled with the anointing and the appointing. Think about Stephen standing alone in that crowd. An exercise of faith and an act of obedience coupled with the anointing and the appointing. Could it be... Could it be that the Lord is here and the Spirit of God has an anointing and an appointing over each one of us that he is just waiting to manifest? And as he stands here, and he searches our hearts. He looks for a woman who says, I will do it. I will exercise my faith. I will step in to an act of obedience, realizing I won't be able to control it because the work of the Spirit is unexplainable. I won't be able to predict it. I won't be able to explain it. I won't be able to plan it. And I won't be able to stop it. Because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us we all have one. We all have one. John says, but you, you, you have been anointed and appointed. I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to say, girl, you have been anointed and appointed. You have been anointed and appointed. And it is time, it is time to rise up and figure out what are these appointments God has for us. One of the things that I notice more and more of, especially in this political climate, is the incredible disconnect there is between our faith in God's ability to overcome death and take us to heaven and our faith in God's ability to take care of us here on earth. There is an incredible disconnect. And I, be, I am just really beginning to wonder if the Holy Spirit, I just, I just sense him saying, you know, I am just so ready to move on this generation. 
I am so ready to do something in my people and in my church I have never done before. I am so ready, but I am waiting for my people to finally begin to stop relying on their government and on their leaders and on their security and on their comfort and on their safety and start relying on me. I just, I sense it. I, every time I get down on my knees and I just pray for our state and for our nation and for our world and I see what is happening to the followers of Christ globally, I think, oh my goodness, we have got to get ready. We have got to be willing. We have got to be open to the Spirit of God moving and doing something incredible in our lives. So we have the anointing. Scripture tells us we do. Scripture also says we have the appointment of the Holy Spirit. And as you move into this week, you're going to meet Philip. And Philip has some of the most wildest appointments with God on the pages of Scripture. I just love Philip. I love these stories. I cannot wait to pull up a chair at the banqueting table next to Philip and go, would you just tell me what you were thinking when the Holy Spirit started telling you to do what he called you to do. How did you know? I mean, I just cannot wait, because it's wild, crazy stuff. And Philip was like, all right, Lord, I'm, I'll do it. I'm going. And what we're going to see is that because of Philip's obedience, there we have it again, that exercise of faith, that act of obedience coupled with the anointing and the appointing of the Holy Spirit, we begin to see God do things through Philip that he would have never imagined. And in fact, the apostles, they, they couldn't even believe it. They had to go see it for themselves. It was so wild. The appointment of the Holy Spirit you know, there are appointments all around us. There are appointments all around us. One of the things the Lord has really been challenging me to do is, is just be open to those appointments. Now, for those of you who know me well, you know that I am like the biggest chicken on the face of the earth. I am the biggest chicken. And just yesterday, I was at, sitting at Starbucks, and I had my Bible, and I had all my papers, and I had my Unexplainable Life Bible study book, and I had them all spread out over the table. And, and I just said, okay, Lord, if I have an appointment here, show it to me. And the Lord said, well, you need to give your book away. And I'm like, well, how am I going to do? That's just weird. I'm not going to walk up to somebody and go, here's a book, you want it? Like, that's just weird, Lord. Like, I, I don't know. And the Lord said, you're going to give your book away. So as I'm sitting there studying, I'm, I'm being a total creeper, and I'm eavesdropping on everybody's conversation <laughs> because I'm trying to determine which person I'm supposed to give the book to. And there's these two women sitting over here, and they're probably in their early 20s, and they are just, one of them's crying. And she's talking about um, who I assumed was her husband, but later found out it was her boyfriend. And, and so I'm thinking, well, maybe it's her. Is it her, Lord? She sounds like she's going through a really hard time. Maybe it's her. And uh, I'm listening, and I'm listening. And uh, I said, you know, Lord, there's only one. There's a problem here, though. Like, all these tables, like, I'm the only person sitting by myself. I mean, everybody else is sitting in a group, and I only have one book. And, I mean, if I go up and give it to just one person at the table, like, that's bad manners. And so I'm trying to talk God out of this, you know, appointment. Um, and so I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm still listening to the two young girls because I'm thinking, yeah, it's probably one of them. Yeah, it must be one of them. Well, they just start getting nastier and nastier in their language, and they're just railing on their men. And I'm thinking, well, maybe they're, I don't know if they're really open. And so I can tell the Lord just is like, okay, here we go again, chicken little. 
And so these two women get up and they go to the bathroom. And the first one comes out and she walks up to my table and she says, oh, what are you studying? And I said, um, this book, it's called um, An Unexplainable Life, it's on Acts. And, um, and she's like, oh, well, let me see it. And she's like, well, this, oh, wow, okay, this is on the early church. And I said, yeah. And I said, well, you can have it if you want it. And she was like, really? And she got so excited. And then she went back to her table, and then her other friend came out of the bathroom, and she's like, guess what? That girl just gave me a book. And here's the truth of the matter, girls. I, if, I am such a chicken, and God is so merciful. And he, if, if we just pray and we just make ourselves open, God will allow it to happen. I mean, he brought the lady to me. It would be rude if I didn't offer her the book. <laughs> I mean, if we're just open, if we're just open, the appointment of the Holy Spirit. We have the anointing. Are we open to the appointing? I think one of the things, at least for me, that's really difficult about the anointing and the appointing is I like to be in control. I like to be in control. And as soon as I pray that prayer, I have now lost all control. And I've basically said, okay, God, you can just do whatever you want to do. And then the chicken little in me, the fear in me, begins to set in. And so the Lord showed me something in his word in this verse that was just so <laughs> precious to me. And I hope that it blesses you. But when he talks about abiding in the anointing and the appointing, in verse 27, he says, But as for you, the anointing, the sacred appointment, the unction which you received from him abides in you permanently. Permanently abides in you. And when I looked up that word, it means remain. Now here's, here's the Bible nerd in me coming out, okay? So in the Greek, there is a tense, which we really can't, we don't really have this tense per se in the English, but it's the aorist tense, the aorist tense. And basically, um, in this particular tense, there's no, there's no specific idea of time. So it's not like present tense. And it's not like past tense, but it's, it's kind of like um, present tense with a guarantee that it will happen. Does that make sense? It's like, it, they call it the perfective tense. So it's a guarantee that it is, and it's a guarantee that it will be, but the time specified as to how it happens is unclear or open-ended. Okay, so, so, so what does that mean for us? Then we have this substantive, okay? And that is kind of like our, um, what I would call like our predicate nominative. So like if I say, um, Erica is... A teacher. Okay, teacher is the nominative. Teacher describes Erica, but it is a noun. It's not an adjective. Okay, Erica is short is a predicate adjective. Erica is a teacher is a predicate nominative. So the substantive is like the, the nominative part. So what, what does that mean for us? Let's put this together. So what John is saying here is this. You've been anointed by the Spirit. You will always have the anointing of the Spirit. The Spirit is perfecting this anointing over time. The time is not specific. 
And at the perfection of this anointing, you and I become the manifestation of the Spirit. We don't become like the Spirit. We become the manifestation of the Spirit. We become interchangeable with the person and the work of the Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean we become a part of the Trinity. We just become the vessel or the tool that he uses to manifest himself. That's a pretty high calling, isn't it? For John to make a statement like that, this is our anointing. This is our appointment to become the visible manifestation of the Almighty Spirit of God within the world. I think we can probably trust God is going to be the one to do that. That's not something you and I are going to be able to muster up on a really good day. That's going to be the work of God. It's going to be an act of God. It's going to be something only God can do. The other thing that is so interesting about this word, talking about the Spirit remaining, is it means to tarry for the sake of one's own. The Spirit of God has laid his anointing upon us and he is tarrying for the sake of one's own. I love that. The other thing that's very interesting is that in the, wor in the Greek, this word is me, no. Me, no. It's not about me. Me, no. Him, yes. My control, no. His control, yes. My fear, no. His, con his courage, yes. Me, no. Do you love that? Not you, girl. You, no. Know. Him, yes. I can remember that. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's all about him. Turn to your neighbor and say, me, no. Me, no. Him, yes. I've already told you that I have a very... Uh, strong issue with fear. And, and God in his great mercy has been working on this issue in my life for many, many years now, and he continues in his great mercy to do that. But just this last summer, um, I was traveling. I was in Cincinnati. We were downtown. I was at a conference. It was not like a super good area of town. You had to have like a special key card to like get on the elevator and then another special key card to like press the button to go up to your floor. And so one night I'm in my hotel room and um, I'm, I'm propped up on the bed and I've got my laptop on my bed and, and I'm answering some emails and I'm working on some stuff and um, all of a sudden I'm, I'm sitting there and I hear the sound at my door, just this, you know, like somebody's going to open the door. And so I perk up, and all of a sudden I hear my hotel room door open. And I jump out of bed, and the very first thing that crosses my mind is, don't let the person cross the threshold. Because once they cross the threshold, they can shut the door and nobody will hear you scream. So I jump, I throw my laptop, I jump out of bed and I go running to the door of my hotel room like a bull in a china shop and I just start screaming, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. 
And I get to my hotel room and there's this man who has obviously spent a lot of time in the bar, stumble back, and he's like, this, isn't this my hotel room? And I'm like, no, get out, get out, get out. And I slam the door and I lock it, and I just stand there shaking. And I'm just, I'm shaking, and I've just got my back against the door, and I'm shaking, and I'm shaking, and I'm shaking. And I felt the Lord say to me in that moment, Look how far you've come. Look how far you've come. Because a year ago or two years ago, I would have stayed in my bed and thrown the covers over my head and cried like a baby because I would not have known what to do. I would have just been paralyzed by fear. And for some of us, we have made the mistake of allowing our enemy to come in and cross the threshold. And he has slammed the door shut. And we have believed the lie that our anointing and our appointing is over. Or we'll never be brave enough. Or we'll never be equipped enough. Or we'll never be smart enough or we'll never be ready enough. We've let him cross the threshold. And it's time to kick him out. It is time to open the door and say, thanks for visiting, it's time to go. And slam the door and lock it behind you. And if you have to scream like a lunatic, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out! Then do it. Because you have the authority to do that. Because you have the anointing and the appointing from the Holy Spirit of God. And it's time for him to go. So what is it that you need to overcome to fulfill your anointing and your appointing? Is it fear? Is it insecurity? Is it pride? Shame? Guilt? What is it? Because the word of God tells us God has given it. He has furnished everything we need to fulfill it. We know the truth. We know Christ Jesus. So it's time to exercise our faith, step out in obedience, and allow him to do the unexplainable. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are so good to us. Every time we read a promise in your word, before we can even tell you why that promise cannot be fulfilled, you follow it up with some kind of truth to reassure us, oh yes, it can. Me no, me no, you yes. Oh, Father God, we want to be women who live in our anointing, who are open to the appointments that you have for us. Women who are intentionally committed to remaining in you, to abiding in you, to listening for those appointments. And God, we thank you and praise you that you are so patient with us and so merciful and faithful to show us how far we've come. Father, I pray for each woman here 
that you would pour out upon her a mighty blessing of courage to be able to say, Lord, I want to live in my anointing. I want to be open to the appointments you have for me. I don't want to live in a spirit of fear or guilt or shame or insecurity. I want to be brave. I want to see you do the unexplainable around me. Oh, Holy Spirit, how we thank you and praise you. We don't understand why on earth our Heavenly Father would give us the blessing and the privilege of being the ones whom you would inhabit, but it is by your sovereign wisdom and your perfect way. And so, Father, we ask that you would give us boldness so that at your coming, we may not shrink back. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.